Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sampat from NTT, and my colleague here, Masataka from Fujitsu. So we are here to talk about uh, acceleration chaining to efficiently handle large AIML workloads in Kubernetes. So uh, please allow me to begin this speak. So uh, in this talk, first, uh, I would like to give you an introduction to our work and then discuss about what are the large workloads we are mentioned here. And then uh, I will give you a brief introduction to the acceleration method currently we use in the, the Kubernetes and advanced setups, so how to accelerate the processes. And then uh, I will jump into the challenges of the, the process acceleration in current Kubernetes. And then we will present uh, the, our uh, Kubernetes extensions for efficiently handle the accelerations and the, the communication between the accelerators. And uh, before we wrap up the presentation, uh, I would like, we would like to give you uh, the live demonstration. I don't know how far we can go with the live, but I'll give you this demonstration and uh, I have the video for the backup purposes. So finally, uh, I hope to wrap up the presentation with our future works. So uh, in Kubernetes recently, uh, especially in these uh, three, four years, the, with the wise, spread adoption of the AI and ML, uh, uh, the applications and the, the methods, the development frameworks backed by the Kubernetes is, have become increasingly utilized. So I try to uh, put up some of the projects which use Kubernetes in the AI and ML, uh, the ecosystem. So uh, I only managed to list a few of them, but uh, as you may know, there's a, a huge amount of project in CNCF which involving with the the AI and ML, the development and the application serving process. So, so uh, they normally, uh, in generally, these uh, these frameworks use Kubernetes as an orchestrator for the resource management. So, uh, normally, this uh, the the pipelines or the so-called the workflows is defined uh, in a we can define it in the scripts or the UI, and then it's come to the the Toolkit or the the, uh, the the tooling section, and then we define the pipelines uh, as a, like a chain of process. Like, a, and uh, this uh, concept is coming from the, the 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 chaining the processes in the single pipeline. So, in the pipeline, we can uh, pipeline is consists with the the smallest atomic parts called steps. So, the terminology might be different. From the whatever tool you use, but the, the basic idea is the pipeline, and it's it made by the uh, the single steps. So uh, once you uh, once you ask Kubernetes to allocate the resources, the what Kubernetes does is it makes a pod for each process, or the uh, the fast function for the each process. And for large AI and ML workloads, it's most sufficient to use the the specialized uh, the process specialized accelerators to do uh, to process the each workloads rather than using the uh, general purpose CPU. So uh, what are the large workloads we are considering here? The, in recent years, the, there has been a surge in use cases where the, the performance requirements cannot be made without using these uh, special accelerators uh, to process the large amount of data or the complex uh, computations. The, and the building, and the, when we build the, the modules, the, the training, the deep neural networks, or the uh, hyperparameter hyper tuning, and large-scale data processing is uh, kind of the, the large workloads we are considering. And when it comes to the, the, the service or application development, we have the real-time inference, and the, the computer vision, and re reinforce, reinforcement learning, and the genomics and the bioinformatics as kind of the large workloads we are considering. And in these use cases, the processing load and the volume of the data flowing through the, the pipelines can vary on the time or the, the, the changing of the requirements. So in these cases, many of the systems need to adapt to their new requirements, but uh, the, it's need to change with the, the, the changing of the requirements. But uh, as an entity and Fujitsu, we are providing the, uh, the, uh, the service framework or the infrastructure for our users to 
implement their application, so their AIML, the, the toolkits. So some, are, some users use the POCs and some of them are uh, providing the service on our platform. So there are various kind of variety of users using the platform. So in our case, it's, we have the growing demand to orchestrate and manage the processing platforms suitable for uh, handling such variety of use cases. So, so uh, current uh, acceleration method and advanced setups in Kubernetes, normally we, uh, acceleration method, we use the port as a main component and then we assign uh, accelerators to the ports and the, all the workloads coming through the ports and offload with accelerators. Once it's processed, it's again go through the port and uh, the, between the communication between the ports is the, the, the main bottleneck and the, always the, they use the CPU to the, uh, the hand, over the, hand, uh, hand over the workloads and the, give the instruction to the accelerators. So when you want to do more specific uh, the enhancements to the, the acceleration process, we normally do the, use the SRIOV or the, use the RDMA to, between the ports or the, the devices. And uh, most of the accelerators recently have, not recently, but they normally have their own network interface. So we could use this network interface to directly uh, send the data to the, to, uh, between the accelerators. And then uh, we can use the PCIe as a connector between the devices, uh, especially when they're in the same uh, the physical host. But uh, we have these uh, PCI extension boxes which you can put uh, six, uh, 16 or 32 accelerators in the row, so you can have many accelerators in one single box. So PCIe between communication, communicate through the PCIe is also a very good option. And then uh, we can utilize the host memory as uh, the media to hand over the data between the accelerators. But the challenges of this system is, it is, it is very non-composable. I mean, they, once you make such changes to the system, once you optimize it for the, some unique use case, the system is itself become very rich and it is very difficult to change it. So normally if you analyze the requirements and all the workloads, then you make the system and uh, make it very rich one. So it's very difficult to change with the requirements. So once you made it, it is uh, incapable to handling the, the requirement change or the, the workload change. So that's lead to the low cost, uh, low cost customization capability because once you optimize the system, it's very difficult to customize. And then uh, for these cases, we use a lot of customized scripts or customized tools for manage the system, which is very difficult, again, very difficult to uh, the integrate with the other systems which you have the, the, the standardized APIs or those things. And then uh, uh, the third one is the vendor locking. Like uh, at right now, like most of, most of uh, uh, the developers or most of the, uh, the, uh, the users are happy with their vendors because uh, you know, vendors doing a great job right now, but in the future, you might need to uh, use the, the heterogeneous accelerators. Like uh, the forthcoming years, there might be like evolutional devices like uh, TPUs and uh, DPUs, like different, different accelerators will be there. And uh, do you, you, you might need to adapt those new accelerators to your system and utilize the, the resources as much as possible. So. If you look into the single vendor, this might be difficult. And the cost effectiveness, and since we use a lot of custom parts and the custom scripts and the custom tools to manage this system, it is very difficult to keep up with the, the, the I mean, the fast life cycle of the Kubernetes. You know, the every six months we have a new release and then we have to maintain our own codes and the, we have to maintain the big, huge team operators to maintain the system. So it is very, a very costly, uh, uh, maintain cost is very high. And last but not the least, all the instructions and the, all the data and the communications go to the CPU. CPU. So that introduced uh, the huge delay and the jitter 
to the workload. So you cannot predict the jitter or the, the delay in the, the process pipeline. So it, it makes you to, to very difficult to provide a stable service in this, with these huge workloads. So address those challenges, we, we try to implement new resource model for the Kubernetes, where you can handle the accelerators and the connection between the accelerators in the native way. So we use the custom resource as a, like one of the method to extend the Kubernetes. So uh, this is not the only method, but th this is how we do it. So uh, you might have the different opinion about it, but this is how we do it, how we did it. So we use the custom resources to extend the Kubernetes resource model. And uh, we, we first we uh, define the three tier level of resources. The first tier is the data flow, which define the pipeline, which is uh, like a, you can uh, define the function chain, like a chain of functions, and the, how do you connect the functions. So this is kind of a YAML, so you can uh, define the function chain. And then we have the abstract layer, uh, which, which, which serve as the abstract layer between the upper functions and the lower functions. The lower functions are the, the individual functions and individual connections which directly manage the physical resources. So uh, my colleague Masataka will be give you the uh, brief about the functional, the resource architecture and the operators and how it works all together. Thank you, Thank you Sam Hello, everyone. I'm Masataka Sonoda. Uh, I explain for five from here. And in the following, uh, we we speak more specific about our extension and mainly focus on the role of operators in these uh, categories. First, pipeline definitions. Operators in this uh, category enable the creation of pipelines in composable way. And when it comes to the custom resource, uh, we have not only a data flow CR, but also uh, other several uh, CRs. Uh, some of them is a function chain CR and function kind CR. Uh, function chain CR is a template for uh, data flow processing pipelines, and each function chain CR has a set of in, uh, available uh, data processing modules, such as uh, infer inference, uh, decode, uh, grayscale, and so on. So function kind CRs are ca catalogs for these uh, data processing modules. Uh, so uh, when you when, when you want to create the data flow CR, you can only select the function chain CR. So back to the uh, introduction of operators. Uh, next, abstract. Uh, operators in this uh, category create individual function or connection CRs according to accelerator or device or connection types. And uh, next, individual functions. Uh, op this category of operators perform our own control for each type of accelerator or device for accelerator chaining. And in this, in this uh, categories, uh, we have each type of operators for each type, each accelerator or device types. And next, individual connections. And operators com uh, in these categories configure unique settings to both accelerator or device at the end of the network path. Uh, according to the uh, connection type. And likely individual functions, we have each type, each type of operators for each connection types. And last, schedulers. A scheduler operator determines where pipelines are deployed for performance and power efficiency. And then uh, we, we briefly describe the uh, flow of deploying a data pro data processing pipelines using this diagram. First, the user creates a data flow CR by using the function chain CRs. And the data flow CR is created. The scheduler determines which accelerator is, uh, each, each data processing module is deployed. And uh, scheduler also determines the uh, connection type for each connection. Then data flow operator uh, breaks down the this data flow CR uh, into the function CRs and connection CRs. And, and then uh, function CRs are created. Uh, function operator uh, creates the each type of individual function CRs according to the uh, accelerator or device type of function CR. 
Similarly, uh, connection operate, uh, when, when the connection CRs are created, a connection operator creates the individual connection CRs according to the connection type of uh, each connection CRs. And then uh, each individual function CRs are created, corresponding operator controls the target accelerator of a device, uh, such as uh, deploying a data flow processing, or a data flow module, or uh, setting networks. Next, uh, we will uh, speak about uh, individual operators. Uh, as mentioned above, uh, we currently support uh, two connection types and three, three de uh, accelerator or device types. This slide shows connections. Uh, first, uh, regarding the Ethernet, uh, we currently support FPGA to FPGA connections through Ethernet. So Ethernet connection operator configures TCP connection establishment to FPGAs both, both the end of the uh, Ethernet connect network path. Next, uh, for PCIe, uh, we currently support communication via first shared memory. So PCIe connection operator configures the shared memory information use this connection to accelerators uh, at the end of the both uh, PCIe path. Next slide shows the functions. Uh, we currently support GPU, FPGA, and CPU. First, GPU. Uh, GPU operators allocate GPUs and shared memory to data processing modules. To be specific, it launches port with GPU and shared memory using the data processing uh, container image. Next, FPGA. Uh, FPGA function operator directly controls of the FPGA resources without port intervention. So it writes FPGA circuits on FPGAs and allocates FPGA resources to data processing modules. Last CPU. Uh, like GPU function operators, a CPU function operator launches a pod with shared memory, shared memory using the data processing module container image. Uh, finally, uh, we will show the overall picture of our system. Uh, implementing uh, just a few resource types we currently support. Uh, the scale of our system is about this, not so small. And uh, operators, uh, each type of each resource type, uh, uh, deployed on the node components. On the other hand, other operators and custom resources are deployed on the controller plane components. And we also make use of the Default Kubernetes functionalities such as Kube API server and Kubet and so on. For example, we mentioned uh, in the previous slide, CPU function operator and GP function operators and launched the pod uh, by using these uh, functionalities. Uh, that's a brief explanation of our system. So let's move on to the live demonstration. Thank you, Masaka. So uh, we start to build something we started to build something simple, but it become more complex now. So let's see whether we can do the live demonstration. Uh, for the, the use case is the uh, real-time inference. So I'm going to show you the one of the use cases of the uh, the heavy workloads we are considering. So uh, we this this uh, this use case coming from the the smart city where you can have you have the thousand of 4K cameras send in the live stream, and then we have to process those live streams and do the inference like post detection or like uh, uh, whatever security surveillance you do. And uh, so to to process those live streams, we we think that uh, we consider that the the cameras send in the live stream through the secure secure network, and then once you get the data, first you have to uh, decapsulize and uh, do the network process, protocol processing and then take the data out. And then uh, you might need to do the routing and the other network processes and then hand it over to the pre-data pre processing, which we use the FPGA. We, we, we think that it might be a good use case to use the FPGA. And then hand it over to the GPU to do the actual uh, the inference or the, the, uh, the inference process. And then... Uh, in this scenario, we uh, we will uh, implement this another data flow, which is uh, we use the uh, data splitter 
FPJ as a data splitter, we split the data stream process and take a, another data stream out. So where where you where you can use it for the the backup or the save the data in the the storage, or then or send it to another application to like a different type of inference or different type of uh, detection. So uh, this is the the real time inference use case we are going to demonstrate. We are only going to use one data stream because uh, it's a uh, uh, it's very heavy so uh, so the the we use uh, two physical servers the servers are in Tokyo right now so they we installed the OS and we set up the Kubernetes on it and uh, we have deployed our the extended uh, custom resource operators and we uh, configured some of the resources which pre pre-configured resources which need to run this system and then uh, the first first step is I'm going to deploy this data flow. This is the function chain I'm going to deploy, and uh, and then I will uh, I will deploy the application which is the data sending part and data receiving part. So and uh, in the in the pipeline we first uh, data sender will uh, use the gray tunneling to do to, to securely transfer data to the, to the data center. And then uh, we need to uh, we need to gray decap, do the gray decap, and take the data out from the the, the tunnel. And then uh, we do the routing. And decap and routing is done by the the Intel FPGA N3000. And then we uh, use the uh, the network uh, QSFP plus network connection to the second FPGA, which uh, work as a splitter. It uh, split the data stream into the multiple streams. So this time we use the two 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 data streams, split into the two data streams, and then uh, one of the data streams uh, hand over to the another FPGA through the QS FP Plus network. Okay. And uh, this is the Silinx uh, U250. It is a FPGA, uh, another FPGA, and then uh, there they do the decode image, right, uh, H264 uh, to the row. And once you convert the, the, the images, then it hand over to the, the second FPGA, which do the uh, resizing and the filter, filtering and resizing. And uh, with, uh, these silence FPGAs are doing the pre-processing the data and make it ready to do the inference in the GPU. And uh, in the final hope, from this uh, resize, and uh, filter and resize the FPGA and GPU connected to the host memory. So these uh, three accelerators are in the same uh, physical host, so they can uh, hand over the data to the host memory. So what we're going to do is we're going to define this data flow and hand it over to the Kubernetes, and Kubernetes uh, will first do the scheduling, and it will allocate the resource uh, in the servers, and then uh, it create the functions, and it will create the uh, the lower level operators will create the functions, and then they will create the, the appropriate connection between the functions, and it will provide us the endpoints for the data flow. So then we are going to use those endpoints to do send the data, and the other endpoint we can receive the data. So it work as a pipeline. So uh, so uh, for before I move to the live part. So it might be a little bit lag, so please bear with it. And uh, this is the sample data flow, right? Function chain. So we want to, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I introduced a, a de definition and in this demo. And this is a, a function chain definitions and using this demo. Uh, so, this is a template for the uh, above, above flow. So this, uh, uh, this, this def definition includes five connection definitions and four function definitions. And this one is a data flow created from this function chain. So this data flow definition includes uh, information about uh, this function chain. And after applying and scheduling uh, this data flow, uh, scheduling, re scheduling uh, re results 
it, uh, appended to the data flow. So the right one is a part of the scheduled data flow. And this example includes uh, one scheduled connections and one scheduled functions. And uh, ab above is uh, uh, connections from the code main uh, functions to filterize uh, file income main functions. So in this flow, in this above flow, uh, connection three. And uh, scheduling result is the information about route and connection type. So this connection is determined to uh, used, determined to be used uh, Ethernet. And uh, below, below that is the uh, connect functions, uh, the code main functions, the code main functions. So the scheduling result is information about the accelerators uh, on which this function is deployed. So fun uh, <coughs> scheduling result is a, is is a device index and device kind and nodes. So this function is determined to be deployed direct FPGA uh, with index number zero and node named baron04. So let's switch to the console okay. screen, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, console for up on the uh, master node. So now let's let's show the uh, operators. Operators has already been uh, deployed. Please show the operators. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not gonna. Yeah. It's stuck. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so uh, sorry, we have some running ones and uh, the container creating. But I'll, uh, so it's not responsive. Well, so uh, first we have uh, the CPU function operator and the uh, the okay okay. Uh, device managers and Ethernet connection operator. These are all are the tier, T, tier three operators. So actually uh, managing the actual, uh, the compute resource and the, uh, the, the connection resources, right? And then, <laughs> anyway, I have a, a video. So. Yeah. <laughs> These are the resources we define, predefined resources. So these kind of resources we have First, we have the compute resources. These are the, the, the bare nodes. And then secondly, we have the uh, few function chains defined, uh, predefined function chains. So we are going to use uh, this function chain for the deployment. And then we have the function kinds, which, uh, which, which are the definition of the functions, like the CPU decode, uh, FPGA decode, and uh, uh, infra inference functions. And uh, the, the final one is uh, the ICMP TCP is the, 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 the network protocol processor which used uh, to decap the gray and the, use the mirror function in the, the, between two, uh, two FPGAs. And then uh, finally we have the, the several kind of function targets which, uh, which kind of a, uh, another uh, function resource we use to define the, uh, the function chain. Kind of wasting time. Okay. 
So let me uh, move to the, the video. So this is the same uh, video I took today morning. And this is the, uh, the function chain. And uh, as Masataka showed, we first define the functions, what kind of functions are in the function chain, and then the, how they connect. So uh, the order of the functions is not important, but order of the connection is important. That's, that's how you define how, the, how you connect the, the construct the function chain. Right. Then, uh, Then these are the, uh, the controllers, the, the resources we use. And then uh, this is the, uh, all right, sorry. So we are going to apply the data flow. And uh, so once we apply the data flow, uh, these uh, functions will create it, like the decode function, filter resize, high inference in the GPU, and the V gateway is for the, the network decode and the mirror. And then we have to wait till, uh, as you can see, the here is the PCI connection between the, uh, the final FPG and the GPU. It is uh, it is in the pending, it's not done yet, and uh, we need to wait a little bit time. And then you can see there are two, two Ethernet connections. Uh, WB, connect, WB is the code name for our project, so uh, please neglect it. Hmm? Also, thank you. And uh, the web connection, decode to main is the, the Ethernet connection, and then uh, the V gateway, the, the decode is also an Ethernet connection, which also become okay now. And then we, uh, after some time, all the functions and connection get, get okay, then uh, active and running, then we can deploy the, uh, see, uh, here I'll show you. Then we can, uh, this is the, the actual, uh, the data flow after the scheduling. So scheduler put all the, uh, the assignments as I know, all the hardware resources to the data flow, and it will put the on the spec. So if you see the spec, you can see all how the scheduler schedule the uh, the resources. And this is the compute resource connection resource, and here we have the compute resource. And then uh, here I use the GStreamer pipeline to uh, receive the uh, data, and and again uh, this is the the, I use, I set up two GSTMA pipeline to receive the data, and this is the, the controller, and these are the two, uh, uh, the receiving ports, and this is, it will be the sender. So I'm getting to the access to the ports, and I will execute some command. So, ah, sorry. And again, here, I access to the GPUs, so you can see the logs of the GPU, which is actually uh, processing the, the frames. So here, here yeah, now is the FPS. You can see the FPS here is almost zero because nobody sent the data. And once I send the data, the, you can see the FPS uh, become like uh, 15 or it vary between 10 to 15. And uh, then uh, I will set up some GStream pipeline to receive the data. And then this one, I'm going to send the data. So it's okay. So I start to send the data now. From here, you can see the FPS rate uh, increased like 40. Now is if, uh, the GPU is doing the inference. And uh, you can see here uh, two pipelines to receive the data is also getting the data from the uh, two data streams. So finally, uh, 
it with the live demo, but yeah. This is, I wanted to show you like at the end, I wanted to show you this VLC, the stream window, which uh, one of the stream is come, uh, get the raw, raw stream and the other one, we get the, uh, the human detection uh, stream. So this is what I wanted to show you, but unfortunately we couldn't do that. So. So anyway, I will upload the video uh, to the somewhere you can uh, refer it later. So this is the yeah. So this is the uh, our future work. Uh, we hope to open the code base in the somewhere in the community later this year, and uh, we integrate with the AI and ML frameworks also. And uh, we hope to work close with the dynamic resource allocations, which is the, the, we consider as a very important component of the Kubernetes to provide the uh, disaggregate computing. And we also want to uh, work with the CNI extensions for the uh, communication between the devices. So we have another session tomorrow about the challenges of Kubernetes to composable and disaggregate computing, which is a, a kind of a similar topic we are going to do is a panel discussion. Please, uh, uh, please be there. And uh, thank you for your uh, consultation. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's the time. <laughs> <laughs>